Hi everyone, I'm Eric. I am the lab manager at Beta NYC, and we are putting on this presentation in uh, sort of collaboration with uh, the Housing Data Coalition. Uh, you go to the next slide. So the Housing Data Coalition is a space for housing advocates, data policy analysts, and technologists to come together and collaborate. Um, we're sort of just a group of people and organizations who are passionate about housing data and how it can be used to sort of promote public advocacy. Uh, we host monthly meetings all open to the public. So if you're interested, definitely come up to us, then we can get you added to our Slack channel. Uh, we have an active Slack community and we coordinate efforts to support open data advocacy and housing justice throughout all of New York City. Uh, we also share knowledge about housing justice related to tech, data, policy, as well as informal walkthroughs and workshops. Uh, one of our main things that the Housing Data Coalition does is the maintenance of a Postgres SQL database called NYCDB, which we can talk through a little bit now. Uh, so if you're interested at all in sort of getting a look at this data, uh, you can access it at this link here. Uh, it is a GitHub repository that walks you through how to connect to it, how to access all of this really useful information. Next. So you might ask, uh, what is the purpose of NYCDB if we already have so many housing data sets on uh, the open data portal? Uh, so NYC's open data sets, uh, so NYC open data is available as CSVs, XLSs, and PDFs. But to actually analyze and combine this information together to make it useful for analysis, uh, you have to extract the data from those documents and transform it to make it easier to uh, use. And then finally load that into a database to actually make it so that you can analyze all of that like very large information. So by holding it in uh, sort of one place, uh, it makes it a little bit easier for us to navigate all of these different files, as well as take it from other sources that are outside of just the open data portal, such as a few PDFs and other sources that we are able to scrape from as well. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, next slide. Uh, there are a lot of learning resources on the NYCDB website, uh, on H, uh, NYCDB on that GitHub page. Uh, there's documentation available for individual data sets as well as vocabulary. Uh, and uh, we also hold regular trainings to walk through a lot of this information. Uh, as well as the Slack channel is another really great resource. I'm sure anyone in there is very happy to answer any questions you might have about either getting set up or what anything in that sort of uh, data set me, uh, could be uh, could mean. Uh, so one thing about it is that uh, some of you in the room might not be as uh, well versed in some of these sorts of uh, technologies. Uh, maybe getting connected to a Postgres SQL database is a little bit above your head at the moment, which is totally cool. And something that we're sort of concerned about and also thinking about. Uh, so when that's the case, uh, a lot of this information, again, is available on the open data portal. Uh, however, some of it, uh, such as the OCA data, is not available on that portal. Uh, and thus, in the past, you would have to connect to the PostgreSQL database in order to actually access a lot of that information. Uh, however, now we started to work on tools and making that information more accessible which I think Lucy can now talk to you a little bit about. Oh, wait, no, I'm no, there's more slides. I'm so sorry. <laughs> ne sorry, next slides. <laughs> uh, so there are a couple of use cases up NYCDB. I, I forgot about these. Uh, so JustFix uh, has a tool that allows you to look at, uh, to find what buildings in New York City are associated under common ownership, as well as track and add landlord behavior uh, across all of New York City. So this information is able to pull from NYC DB uh, and actually make, uh, make uh, create a tool that makes it easier for you to sort of gain insights like these. Uh, similarly, next slide, uh, NHD also has a displacement alert project uh, that also draws on information from the uh, oh, that draws on information from the Office of Court Administration as well uh, to help. Uh, keep track of displacement in different communities across the city. Uh, now, as I was saying before, um, a lot of the tools, uh, maybe getting connected to the Postgres SQL database might be uh, a little bit over your head at the moment. Uh, so we've been working on this new tool next uh, that allows you to download and access uh, specific parts of this information 
uh, that way you can use it uh, in whatever use case you uh, you might be more comfortable with, whether that be opening it as just an Excel file uh, or opening it in Google Sheets, uh, whatever sort of um, technology or software you're comfortable with, we are working on making it more accessible for you. And Lucy, I think you can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, let's just go up yeah. to the portions of it. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lucy Block. I use she, her pronouns. I work at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, which is also known as ANHD. Um, so we're like a policy and advocacy organization, and I do data work there, um, but we really focus like as an organization more on the campaigns and policies and changing, you know, advocating at like state, city government. Um, but we dabble in data things as well. Um, we do a lot of work in the realm of tenant rights and um, we have a lot of groups that do tenant organizing. We also have worked with and partnered with groups that make up the Right to Counsel Coalition for a long time, also known as RTC, which is a law that was passed in New York City in 2017, which um, guarantees tenants who are eligible uh, under certain income levels that's changed like geographic areas over time. They're supposed to be able to have access to free representation if they're taken to court for eviction um, by their landlord. So it was rolled out in certain zip codes. Uh, it was really successful. COVID hit and, you know, stuff hit the fan. Um, we had eviction moratoriums. We had pauses on eviction cases for a long time. Um, and the right to counsel was expanded across all of New York City as kind of like an emergency measure during the pandemic. Um, anyway, <laughs> lots going on. It's really important uh, that tenants get this right and have it upheld by the courts. There have been all kinds of issues with that. But sort of all along the way, while tenants were advocating for this law and throughout the process, it's been really hard to get actual numbers on who is being taken to court, how many cases there are, where are they concentrated, what are the outcomes, how many tenants have uh, lawyers and how many don't. Um, and so just for years and years, I've been doing this work for like seven-ish years, the whole, you know, from when I began, people were like, we can't tell when people are being taken to court for eviction. We know sometimes at the end of the process, um, but we just don't have data on when these cases are being initiated. And that's one of the most direct indicators of displacement because a landlord is filing to take their tenant to court to evict them from their home. That is a more direct um, cause of displacement than housing code violations, than 311 complaints, than uh, construction violations, all kinds of building sales, all kinds of other stuff, which could also show displacement risk, but is not as direct of an indication. Um, so what that turned into was uh, my organization partnering with Beta NYC, who runs this conference, uh, Just Fix, where Maxwell works, uh, UNHP, which is another advocacy organization in the Bronx, as well as the Right to Counsel Coalition to come together and push the Office of Court Administration, uh, which is the state administration that manages all of this court data, to give us the data on what's happening in housing courts. There was a session earlier today on all of this happening in criminal courts at OCA, which was fascinating because there's like a whole other ecosystem of people trying to get a hold of this data in the criminal realm uh, where we were operating and still operate is in the realm of housing courts. And, uh, you know, it also has to do with what's called HP actions, which are for repairs when tenants sue their landlords to get repairs. But we, what we work with most often or kind of most focused on is eviction cases. And we've been trying to really get a handle on this, understand trends, understand where it's happening. Um, and the OCA housing court data is what has allowed us to do this. So we have gone through a many years long process of advocating for the data with OCA. Um, that was very, uh, in, like, in very large part due to the work of Beta NYC, as well as those other organizations. Um, and back in 2018 or so, they finally gave us access to one level of the data, which had lots of information about cases, but nothing about individual buildings. And then we had to go through a whole legal process of getting additional information um, with 
addresses so that we could link things to buildings, but there's still lots of restrictions. So we've been navigating just the complexity of the data, um, but that step was huge because it opened it up where we were actually getting feeds of data on these cases, what borough they were in, what court they were in, the date that they were filed, the status of the case, the primary claim amount being the amount of money that the landlord was uh, suing a tenant for in the case of claiming that they're not paying their rent. But the courts were like, we can give this to you. It's in an XML file, which I'm going to just say from my like less technical perspective is like, if you all have ever seen, I mean, there's lots of technical people in the room, but like an HTML page with all of these brackets and like nested information. I think XML is like an HTML type version of data. I'm familiar with CSVs. I like my data to be in columns and rows. Um, I would have no idea what to do with XML. Um, and that's like, they're like, we'll give it to you, but this is, this is it. This is what you're getting. We don't have it for you in CSVs. Partially because it was, you know, nested where there were all of these relationships between rows and all this stuff. So it, from my perspective, that's a mess. It's like great that they want to open it up, but there's not a whole lot I can do with that personally. But luckily, Maxwell was there and he did know what to do with it. So you want to describe what you did with that? Sure. Yeah. So this was kind of the first step when we first got that um, uh, like non-address level data. And so we kind of like went to work trying to make sense of the, the structure. So as I'm saying, it's kind of, you know, all the data is developed for their own internal practices of kind of like actually administering the courts and scheduling new hearings and all this stuff. So it's in this kind of like complicated nested structure that makes a lot of sense for their purposes of kind of like managing cases. But um, as he was saying, is, is like really not uh, designed for the kind of analysis that we would want to do. So we had to kind of take the, the limited documentation that was available and try to coordinate and ask questions of the uh, OCA folks uh, on their end uh, and kind of translate all of those nested connections of the XML uh, for each case into a series of, of tables that could be turned into CSVs that folks can work with. So we kind of went about that uh, data cleaning process and set up all kinds of uh, like automated structures that we're uh, still kind of like working on, on and maintaining today so that we can uh, keep that feed of data that we get on kind of a weekly basis updated and then uh, share it out in, in all these different ways to kind of first version of that were these like giant dumps of the CSV files of the tables. So uh, those uh, we make available on, on our GitHub um, and people can uh, get the new data every week that it comes out. Um, but this is still not like super accessible because there are, uh, you know, many millions of, of rows and spread across like 11 different tables. So it, it involves a lot of work to kind of piece together uh, and make sense of um, uh, we're often using it in the database, but uh, these like CSVs of uh, like size limitations of a file have become a much bigger problem, and that's kind of where uh, Kevin's work started to fit in. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. Second here. Hey, I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm not associated with any housing group. I'm just a housing data coalition member and a professional software engineer. Uh, so I entered the group basically like and learned all these things. Uh, and it just, it seemed like there are a lot of problems that were very ripe for like creating a small app that would make it easier to get pieces of this database, uh, exported to your local machine so that you could analyze it easily in Excel. Uh, and did you want to describe one of those cases? Yeah. Well, okay. I, I, I think what, what I will describe just like coming at it from my perspective of somebody who is competent in Excel and. You know, like that's where I started off with my data analysis. Um, even something like GitHub, I sort of understand it a little bit at this point, but it also just like breaks my brain. So, you know, we got it to this point where we have like these 11 tables and I'm like, awesome, these are CSVs. I can just click on one and download it. I know how to do that. Um, if you click on it, any one of these is like 400 megabytes, 500 megabytes. Yeah, what? The gigabytes? No, megabytes. Yeah, no, no, like half a gigabyte. Okay. Um, you know, only half a gigabyte, have a gigabyte, but you know, this is like, I know this is all really small and I think we'll be able to share out the slides after this says the data set is too large for the Excel grid. So I don't know if any of you have tried to open up a data set of millions of rows in Excel, it'll go to like a million and four thousand rows, something like that. Um, yeah, it won't show you the whole thing and like, good luck if you want to do a formula on it, conditional formatting filter, like you can't really do anything in Excel with a data set that large. Um, and then, as Maxwell was saying, there's 
11 tables. We've got index, causes, addresses, parties. So even though we have like a table of relationships between them, it's just like so big and sprawling. And what I like to do when I start working with a data set is like look at the different columns, try to understand the relationship. What does this mean and what does that mean? Index has the type of case it is and the port it was in. Uh, but if I want zip codes for the case, I have to go to OCA addresses and do that join. So there's just like no way to do that in a spreadsheet program with data sets that are starting off as millions of rows and trying to manage the relationships between them. Um, even if you have pretty good spreadsheet skills, it's just totally unmanageable. And you have to work in something like Postgres, the new SQL, R, Python, like you need some other heavier skills. Um, so one of those routes is NYCDB, which Eric was talking about, which is an amazing database of all of these really important data sets compiled together. But you still have to know how to use SQL and you kind of have to get involved with the Housing Data Coalition if you don't have enough understanding to like download the Python program onto your computer and set it up yourself. So there's still a bit of a barrier. And we do that somewhat on purpose because we want to make sure that folks are like aligned with our mission of using it for the right reasons. Um, but yeah, there's still this additional layer of like, we put together this, well, Maxwell put together this GitHub page and, and opened up the data to some degree, but like how open is it if you can't just download the CSV and open it up in Excel? So I know that's not like one particular scenario, but that is, that's how I would have seen the problem from my perspective at that point in time. So yeah, so uh, with like with that understanding, and I as like a new member of this group uh, with plenty of software engineering expertise, and like knowing SQL, um, it was easy for me to log in to like a SQL console. Uh oh. Boom. Okay, yeah, we're seeing the same thing. You think? Get the bottom of the shipment. Whatever. This is close enough. Uh, great. So if, for example, we just wanted to pull like all the cases from this month in like two courts, just the Bronx or Brooklyn, this is sort of an arbitrary example that I just pulled up. Uh, this is like an amount of data that would, that would be very manageable, um, in Excel. So I can get rid of this like limit 10. Um, and to me, this takes like very little time to assemble together. There's only 78 cases right now. Uh, and this is like super straightforward. But as it might be obvious, I'm not sure how many people here float in SQL, but like if you're only an Excel expert, like this language is a whole new discipline to learn. It's like very inaccessible. Um, and like to Lucy's point, like you kind of need to write it out this way in this language to access it from NYCDB. Um, and what's worse is that if you wanted to do Lucy's example of, of getting just addresses that are referenced in cases from the last month, you need to write quite a bit more complicated SQL using joins, using tricky expressions, uh, which is just very prohibitive for many HDC members trying to analyze this data. Um, just like get a, could you do a show of hands? Raise your hand if you um, feel comfortable with spreadsheets like Excel or Google Sheets. And then uh, keep your hand up if you are comfortable with SQL. And some of you kept your hand up before you knew what I was going to say. Uh, okay, SQL and then how many of you are come? I don't know what else. Uh, comfortable with R? Cool. Yeah. So we're like decreasing. But yeah. I definitely. I would say like maybe half ish in the room are comfortable with SQL. Yeah. And so right. So like bridging the gap is often a big deal, and it's often the case that like people doing work closer to like tenant organizing are less likely to have the more technical skills. Um, so my like software engineering brain kicked in, and I was like, like eighty percent of my job is converting tables from one format to another. I should be able to do this and generate like a SQL, like sorry, a CSV out of this stuff. Um, and so coming out of a couple of meetings where these ideas came up a lot, I just like built a little prototype on my computer. Um, and this is like V1 of the thing that we built. The, the finished version is quite a bit better. Uh, what's notable about this one is it's endlessly scrolling uh, and totally like hard to figure out what's going on here. Uh, but basically what I did was I just took every column from this OCA index table and made it filterable. So you can just pick what you'd like to filter by. Uh, and then you click a button and it gives you a CSV. Um, so if you want to do the same exercise of uh, just things filed this month, and I think you can only pick one court at a time in this version. So if I pick just Bronx. Um, you have to like know what the value is. You have to type it in manually and you have you can only do one. 
Um, but then you can click this button. Um, and assuming my internet connection is good, you can then open up a CSV. It's only 11 kilobytes and it has all that data and it's accessible here in a way that someone could analyze it in Google Sheets or Excel or using R very easily. Um, so then, so I took this prototype that I built uh, and I brought it back to the broader group. I got feedback from Lucia Maxwell among others. We also met with a broader uh, group of, of organizations that's specifically focused on OCA data. Um, and we did some iterating and came up with this, um, which is like at its core, the same idea, um, but it's quite a bit more, uh, it's just like it, a way better way to solve this problem. So specifically here, you can pick like March 1st, 2024, not specify an end date. Um, you can filter just on the things that seemed to be like useful and interesting. So it's like classification, type, and court uh, are like the only things that you might filter by. And then we tell you what all the courts are. You don't have to memorize the exact name of it and how it's capitalized and stuff. Uh, and so, oh, and I think <laughs> I actually did make this mistake. I called it uh, like Brooklyn Civil Court or something instead of Kings County. Um, but here it's spelled out that like these courts are the ones that cover all of New York City. Um, you can also flip by classification. If you're looking into evictions specifically, you can pick what you're looking for. Um, and I might as well, I'll just do this, these court cases here. Um, and then from here on out, it's, it's more or less the same thing. You just download a CSV suitable for Excel, suitable for something else. Uh, yep. And this is the new table. It has way more stuff in it. Um, but. Uh, my the my favorite thing in it, in this case that I mentioned earlier and that Lucy mentioned is, if you want to know from all of these cases, oh, I wonder, yeah, if you want to know from all these um, uh, cases, just what addresses are referenced in any of these cases, you can pick to export from a different table applying those same filters. So you can grab like the index and the addresses table. Uh, and here, these are re addresses referenced in cases since March 1st of this year in these courts that cover New York City. Uh, and yeah, you got zip codes. You um, put those two tables a little bit side by side. So you can kind of see both of them at the same time. Like the index table as well? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So I want to try to show people. So, okay, so this is uh, just an ID number, uh, index number ID. Okay, we'll just do it scrolling. Here, does this work? Let me. Yeah, I'll just use your take over. Okay, um, here is the first table we downloaded called the index table. So it's got these identification codes, the court, the date it was filed, the whether it's residential or commercial. So important information about the case. It doesn't have any information about where the case happened except for the court that it happened in. And this is the more private version of the data, so we don't have full addresses in it, but we do have zip codes. And so if you want these zip codes, you have to do a join of these tables. And Kevin's tools would allow you to download both of them filtered on the same criteria so that if you know how to do a V lookup in Google Sheets or Excel, like a fairly simple formula, you can then join all of these cases so I don't really know how to use the numbers yeah, program yeah. Um, <laughs> and and add the zip code to it so that anybody could then have this like subset of cases um, with all of that important information, add the zip code and then do some grouping by zip code to see how many residential eviction cases were there in zip code 10003 versus um, non-payment, I forget what, oh, commercial cases versus mm -hmm. residential cases and do some of that basic aggregation and analysis. What else are we going to talk about? Uh, maybe the last thing is just that this this downloading tool, uh, the last version that I showed, it, it's like publicly available on the internet. Um, you need to know a password to get into it, but like this URL is just out there for anyone to use. Uh, we we are like a little bit careful in that password for the same reasons that we're careful about who we give access to NYCDB, that we want to make sure people are, are using it and keeping tenant privacy things in mind and stuff. Um, but yeah, this is up. It's shipped, and and we're hoping that like tenant organizers uh, and and organizations working for tenant justice can do good things to it. Yeah, and I think maybe you know people can ask questions. We're happy to answer them. But if folks are interested in this work generally, um, you can absolutely join the Housing Data Coalition, and that is one like 
great entry point and their monthly meetings, which I'm sure will plug more. Um, and then I think also if you're specifically wanting to like play around with this tool, just come up to us afterwards and we can, I think we, we do have the link to it. So we can just give the password to folks who want to play around with it. It's just more, it's, a, it's in beta. Okay, Eric, we'll send it back to you. Yeah. So, in anyone here in the housing data coalition Slack already? Or all one person? Also, so yeah, this is a good plug for that. Uh, anyone who's like sort of interested in it, uh, are you guys interested in housing data like in general? Do you think that this is like something that is useful? Okay, cool, cool. Uh, can I ask, has anyone done any projects using? Any data from the uh, open data portal using housing data? Does anyone have any of sudden? Can anyone talk about it a little bit? I just want to, we're trying to get a feel for sort of what's going on with housing projects and where how the HTC can sort of intersect. One of the projects I work on is just using the Pluto data. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the number of 550 unit buildings in New York City and where they're located. And we're specifically looking at those that were serving or located in low and moderate income areas. Uh, and how they might be affected by local 97 and green retrofits and, uh, decarbonization. Yeah. Uh, this one. Yeah. Also, so like, I think that that's like sort of something that like the housing data folks is like really interested in like helping to assist with projects like that. Uh, so I would definitely suggest that people get involved with uh, those projects if this is something that you're like sort of interested in. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm an urban studies student, so I used uh, housing data person with my classwork. Um, I make specific now with a lot of like ownership data and just see like which, which properties on the university owns and like what the relationship is between Columbia and like the neighborhood in which they film at large. Awesome. Uh, does anyone have any questions about HDC, uh, OCA data, uh, the filtering tool, anything like that? Yeah. Fun with four folds of projects full page in the city. Yes. Let me explain to OCA and Tim, I think Lisa or Maxwell talk more about the projects that I will offer. Um, I mean, I can mention a, a few that might be relevant. Uh, so we showed a few at the beginning that are like kind of like bigger ASP uh, projects so, of like nonprofits. So uh, the one that, that I work for is called JustFix. Uh, yeah, we may make this tool called Who Owns What, where you can look up your landlord and learn all sorts of stuff about your building, um, as well as uh, kind of using all of that data that's made available through NYCDB to do kind of like more complicated analysis of, of actually related to that ownership question. So trying to like uh, sort through behind all the LLCs that own every individual property to be able to kind of link them together. Um, and so then you can know who owns your building kind of behind the LLC, as well as what are all the other buildings that they own. So uh, to kind of like empower tenants to, to organize uh, across the portfolio and kind of build even greater, you know, tenant power and leverage over the landlord and uh, in, in organizing like rent strikes and that sort of thing, um, uh, as well as just kind of like learning more information about uh, your building and like lawyers and advocates use it all the time to kind of like prepare for cases. Uh, it's like very similar use case to um, ANHD's uh, Just Place an Alert project. Um, but there's also lots of like kind of like smaller, more uh, specific use cases that the housing data coalition engages with. So a lot of it um, is kind of driven by requests and, and questions that we get from uh, folks in the community. So often like tenant groups or like advocacy uh, students sometimes kind of like reaching out that will uh, help when when we have time. Um, and so one of the the kind of like main sources of those questions is the right to rental coalition, which. Uh, Lucy was talking about. Um, so they're doing all kinds of great work to kind of, you know, after uh, doing all the work to get that law passed, to kind of defend it now against um, being kind of like hollowed out by lack of funding and the, the rise in, in cases after the uh, COVID addiction moratoriums were lifted. And so uh, we've been able to do a lot um, specifically with the OCA data, being able to kind of analyze it and uh, use the kind of insights of, of lawyers who are on the ground and understand how the court system operates and how these housing cases uh, proceed uh, through the courts uh, and to kind of translate that into insights in, in the data and be able to answer specific questions that can kind of help them in their campaign uh, messaging and just kind of like understanding of the situation. So, um, you know, the most basic example would just be kind of like the counts of evictions over time. 
Uh, and so we were able to like put together some tools to uh, track that information. So the uh, eviction crisis monitor was one thing that we put together to be able to kind of see how those cases were developing through all the different kind of patchwork of uh, moratoriums throughout that period, as well as uh, in the period now where everything's kind of opened up and uh, uh, the courts and lawyers are getting kind of overwhelmed. So being able to see the like declining rate of representation for tenants is a, is a big one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think um, just one thing that is coming to mind for me is like, I think it is like the Housing Data Coalition, I think is um, it's helpful to think of it as like a network and community uh, where NYCDB is a really strong like basis and infrastructure for projects and it kind of underlies everything. But then there's a real mix of folks with technical expertise and people were just interested in like tenant rights and how data and technology can be leveraged in positive ways as, as opposed to extractive and exploitative ways um, that displace tenants as opposed to help keep them in their homes. Um, and so there are a lot of different projects that branch off from it as Maxwell was referring to. And this is, you know, a bit of like a, we don't, we don't do the best job of keeping this really actively maintained, but this is just like a sample of projects that HTC members, sorry, that's a gerbil or a rodent of some sort. Uh, just a sample of projects that, that people who are involved with HTC have worked on over the years. And some of these are really like volunteer driven and independent. And some of them are part of like our nonprofit organizations that do this work, like where Maxwell works and where I work. Um, but it is an excellent place to um, join and check out if you're interested in any type of project housing project using um, data and technology uh, because you can tell people about what you're working on, find people who want to work on it with you, uh, get deep, a lot of people come and present what they're working on and get feedback from other people who have worked with similar data um, and have a lot of like content knowledge and experience and just get that feedback. Um, and there are different there are plenty of different ways to volunteer. Um, some of the needs of the of the of HTC are like somewhat boring sometimes. Like with the OCA data, we really need help like documenting and having more people understand just how com complex. Like you saw those eleven tables, and there are only a few people who have spent the amount of time that it requires to like understand what a primary flame amount is and like how you link these things together. And so we can always just use people to help us like maintain that infrastructure and quality of what we're doing and hold that knowledge over time um, so that it continues. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? I'm curious about, you know, like when researching like, you know, midnight or one in the morning, I'm thinking there's got to be somebody else out there I'm looking up the same landmark or the same organization. And I just wish that there was some um, way of, like, when I would adjust fix or the DAP portal, um, I'm curious, like, is anyone, like, tracking who's, like, I would love to just go to just fix and have just fix say, would you like to find other tenants of the landlord that you're researching? I mean, sometimes it's not our landlord, and maybe you'd be like, no, but just let me, like, if you're interested, um, other people are working for the same landlord or the same organization or the same LLC. So I for you here, you know, there's a Google sheet or something that just would allow us to connect in a more organic way that doesn't happen. And I know there's a lot of people out there doing the same stuff that I'm doing. Yeah, I think that that's very true. Uh, and I think that it's something that we uh, sort of aim to do on some level with HCC, uh, hoping to sort of connect people who are uh, interested in these types of things and like uh, interested in sort of doing some of the like research behind it. Uh, but then on like a more individual level, I feel like it sometimes becomes difficult to find the people who are like so uh, closely tied in terms of like, oh, every landlord, like ever uh, under this specific landlord is like doing, is searching and doing this type of research. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that is something that we would like to, and we can like look more into as well. Um, but yeah, I think that a lot of it is also just like sort of applicable across. Uh, and even if it doesn't relate necessarily directly to like the same exact landlord, uh, sort of 
being able to be in contact with other people who are going through like a similar type of um, uh, similar types of issues, uh, which is very common both in terms of RTC, uh, in terms of the Right to Counsel Coalition, as well as the Housing Data Coalition, uh, is sort of like helpful in how to like navigate and learn more about like these issues and what's going on related to housing, both in New York City and New York State, largely. I can just add that's like a, a really great suggestion. Definitely one that we've got as well um, in the past about um, the world website and, and that for on similar ones. I, I think some hesitation has just been around like land security again. Like if you were to be able to access that, there there wouldn't be any way to stop your landlord from yeah. signing up on yeah. that and saying, okay, period, these are all the tenants that are like organizing that's and retaliate, you know, retaliate yeah. which is always there. So I think uh, probably like the solutions about us kind of like, a little bit outside the realm of theater, but to just like get organized with your neighbors and uh, also try to like join a, a tenant union and not like that build that kind of power together. I mean, there's also nothing stopping from just like going out and door knocking um, some of those buildings and like that. Um, you know, it can sound like innovating, but it's, it's really like the best way to do this. You can just kind of show up, they start like buzzing uh, on and see if we'll let you in and just kind of start knocking on doors if you're dealing with, uh, you know, terrible condition building. A harassment and that sort of thing from your landlord. It's like you know, it's the being the vaccine thing and all their other zoning. So, um, I mean, you know, you have a lot more success than you would think just kind of showing up on a weekend and uh, and not being on doors and, and talking to people and that and I get them organized once more if you want the like support from that. It's definitely the best thing to like reach out to the local and it's often there's going to be one in, in your neighborhood or or like a, a, a large get kind of like for a white one or something like that uh, to talk to. So, I feel like that's probably able. The best way to build plus it. Yeah. How do you get your name out as an organization to tend us before they are in crisis in this building at that time? And yeah, I see it's almost too late, but how do you reach out to you? What is your, you know, you met this at Patreon public? I think that that's kind of falls outside of the Housing Data Coalition specifically. But there are other organizations within the city who do that specific type of work, uh, especially those related to right to counsel. Um, like I have gone to uh, court watches before, which some that right to counsel does, uh, where basically they go to people who are having eviction uh, proceedings and sort of make sure that they are aware of the fact that they have. Uh, a right to an attorney uh, in these proceedings prior to them going into their case. Make sure that, like, sort of, no one, uh, they are aware of what they should have access to uh, in the sort of, like, very difficult to navigate scenario. Uh, so even then might be a little bit too late as the case is, like, going to happen as they're sort of already at the courthouse. Um, but I think that that is something that, like, uh, HDC specifically, uh, does less of because it really is a little bit outside of the realm of like data. However, HCC works closely with the Right to Capital Coalition uh, and the Right to Capital Coalition. That's something that they have in mind. Uh, there are a lot of organizations within the Right to Capital Coalition who all play like very different roles uh, outside of just like sort of data and technology who are actually like out uh, making, uh, doing like community coalition building and making sure that people are aware of. Uh, all of that going on in their own communities. Uh, Beta NYC actually helped out with the tool uh, to make people aware of um, RTC, uh, Right to Council um, members and partner programs throughout all of New York State that I can share with you later. Uh, it also helps keep track of um, different uh, elected officials who are like in favor or opposed to different Right to Council um, legislation that's credible being reviewed. Uh, so yeah, uh, there is work being done to sort of do uh, that and make all these things more aware, but uh, it also sort of falls outside of we, um, just HCC, but luckily there are a lot of organizations throughout the city and throughout all of New York that are doing this very important work. Um, can I just add on to what you said, Eric? I really um, like the example of Court Watch because um, I think there's like really an eco, it's really like an ecosystem of organizations and no single entity that can do everything. Um, so in this case, if you're thinking about a tenant who is already facing eviction and in court and uh, 
given what's been happening in housing courts, there's a high chance that they haven't actually been connected to a lawyer, even if they should have been connected to a lawyer. You have organizing groups that are on the ground telling them what their rights are, but then they also simultaneously have larger campaigns where they're trying to solve the problem at a much more system-wide and holistic level. And so they're both talking to tenants, making sure they know their rights, as well as potentially engaging those tenants, if not immediately, then in the future, in these larger campaigns where they're trying to pass a law such as universal statewide right to counsel, which would uh, universally require tenants to have access to those lawyers in courts. So in that way, like you, the most successful groups and organizations and coalitions tend to have that kind of multiple method model of like engaging people around what they need in the short term, as well as connecting them to much like longer term campaigns, which are going to make bigger changes. And then I feel like the groups that are here today, we, I think we have an important, but a like a much more of like a supportive role of looking for these opportunities where like, okay, if you're somebody like Kevin who has software development experience, but is not a tenant organizer, you've done some of it. I am not a professional, like hired tenant organizer at a community-based organization. He's like, okay, I can think of a scenario where my skills can help build this tool, which is going to help build other tools. Um, or this map that Eric was mentioning that Beta NYC worked on where that safe coalition was like, we are trying to pass an entire campaign to get statewide right to counsel and we need to be able to visualize which of our representatives support it and don't support it and where we need to build up our base across the state. And Beta NYC was like, we know how to make an interactive map that you can track that with. And they made this map. And so they're, we're always trying to like work very closely with those organizing groups to make sure we understand their needs as best as possible and are finding opportunities to produce things that are going to be genuinely useful for the larger term. What? And maybe one other example similar to that, um, like maybe related to your point of trying to like act quickly when there's a, a risk uh, of eviction like that is the of the data that we've um, made accessible and, and kind of like fought to get access to with the address level eviction data. There's still some limitation on how much we can make it available, but um, for many buildings in the city, we're, we're able to, to publish those uh, counts of eviction filings in, in like close to, uh, to real time uh, with our like kind of weekly update. And so it's going to be possible um, both through the, the Who Wants What tool as well as uh, AMHD's stat portal to be able to see at a building level uh, when new eviction cases are are filed. And so, um, you know, big, like less about the, the kind of individual who's going through that. But if, for example, uh, in your building, you see that there's a, a an eviction filed, like that could be uh, give you the kind of like forewarning to, to go and, you know, connect with all your neighbors and, and make sure that you kind of like find whoever uh, is at risk of that, being able to kind of like connect them and support them and, um, you know, get organized within your building. So kind of like fight back against that. And, um, you know, again, kind of like connect with other groups in, in the city and kind of uh, get that base of support and, you know, so that you're not like alone going to court and, and fighting this um, and, and either of your neighbors. So that that's like one way that the data can kind of like play a small role in just kind of empowering folks with, um, uh, like the forewarning as well as just like the, the data to, to back some of that. Yeah, I'm the static but I'm now it asked the question about how the public like having that information the first time you can I need my exit. Yeah. And you present it as an outsider. I'm trying to figure out how it useful with the speed. So I need to prop now my own and so by new some you just said point of view. It now makes more sense. Because if I live in, in this back in the South, area called one, when like we're in on the eight, I can go now to your website, your, or your city as giving me a chance. I would love to see how many people would have to be back to for that zip code. And I should say, they need to figure out the land and the and you need to not get more people involved, have more of a stand, more vocal power in terms of that. So it makes more sense. Like just having this, I didn't understand but now I'm listening to you guys and understanding the different components and how they all around that job as a person in a big small sense. Thank you for your uh, Thank you for that example because I was able to pull up exactly how we would do that. Um, so for that portal, which is the, um, 
the displacement alert project that I manage at my job. Um, we incorporated the housing court data into the project so that people could see like literally when are eviction cases being filed in a given geography or your building and be able to actually get that more, not more real time, like weekly updates to see if cases have been filed, you can go and knock on those doors. We're only allowed to make this information available in buildings that have at least 11 residential units because the courts were like, if we give you any more detail, if you make that public, then it um, risks people's privacy, um, which we understand, but we want to also help people be able to stay in their homes. Um, and so you need like one layer of access to this. If you go to that portal, which is in the links, which Eric, do we have a way of getting people the slides? No. Okay, we'll, we'll work on that. And then, uh, but this is that portal. You have to make an account to be able to see this. So you can go in there, you can request access. Um, and if you have trouble, I'm happy to help out with that. But once you do that, you can do queries where you're like, show me all of the housing court cases. And I just used the zip code you used as an example. Uh, I pulled all non-payment type eviction cases since March 1st. So this is a very similar query to what Kevin did, but in one specific zip code. Um, yeah, and then you can look at these specific buildings and addresses. Uh, these tools are linked together. So if I found one there and saw the housing court cases, I could then go to ownership. And this tells you who owns it and also links over to who owns what, which is the website that Maxwell manages and can show you the other buildings owned by this landlord. So these are things that we spend oh, some time well, <laughs> Either somebody who owns a lot of buildings or a common yeah, name, right? Yeah, we're <laughs> referencing that actually right now. <laughs> um, so this is what we spend all of our days thinking about and working on. And this say to you something. Um, and then I get pie. This is what you're saying. Good worrying tool, that big is the tool. Can it be helpful or useful to detect them to kiss with the neighborhood? Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's also something I've given lots of thought to. It's really, it can mean so many different things at my organization. I think most of us involved with this work, we think about it in terms of displacement. Gentrification and displacement often go hand in hand, especially in New York City. Um, but there's so many different ways that it happens. It plays out differently in like Brownsville than it does in Bushwick, than it does on the Lower East Side, and it does in the Bronx. And so one of the things that I think about a lot is like what data might indicate it more in one neighborhood versus another. So is it happening in an area that has lots of red stabilized housing or lots of small homes? And the housing court data is great because not, I mean, it's, none of this is great, but um, when someone is being taken to court for eviction, again, that's a really direct indicator. Um, but we also put in there, we put, data on building sales and HPD complaints, you know, complaints about conditions, all kinds of stuff. But the short answer is yes. Wait, wait, wait. Another question is for anybody? If John, Christian, I just wanted to do a plot on another tool for displacement that the city of New York City has put together, um, the Equitable Development Data Explorer. Um, and it's a map that shows neighborhoods that are could be at risk of displaced in. Uh, click on displaced in this. Quarantine. Yeah. yeah, so we didn't even talk about like census data and all the stuff that I can do. There's a, there's so much out there. I, always, I wonder if like, you know, how there's like opportunity zones where affordable developers are offered opportunities to invest in properties and and work on the like I'd be so interested to see like the an overlay of the opportunity zones with the the areas that are most at risk and already have had a lot of eviction and a lot of um, tenor harassment because what might be happening now that there's gonna be more funds and more readily available funds for affordable housing development is that it might actually be providing more funds to landlords who are already in the business of unhousing tenants who can now take advantage of affordable housing development 
on one hand, undermining affordability, and on the other hand, benefiting from public funds in order to, um, you know, develop, have, have more uh, development opportunities. So I don't think that's my opinion. We should not be making public funds and tax dollars available to those who have already undermined affordable housing anywhere. Yeah, maybe just another plug for how to get a coalition work is uh, the NYCDB database that kind of like puts all of this together it is uh, it is a community um, project that we're all kind of like building together. And so um, there's a lot of things that you can do already with the data sets that are in there, but more people are always working on contributing new data sets. So for example, just um, a month or two ago, we had a like little hackathon meeting in person where everybody got together and and of work on adding new data sets and putting the documentation, things like adding better uh, spatial data was one of the things that we, so something like those kind of zones would be something that you could add in and be able to do um, even more analysis. And so if there's something that you're particularly interested in, you, you're not seeing it in there, um, that's something that we could kind of like work with you to, uh, to help get you up to speed with what you need to know to contribute more data sets and kind of get it filled with even more things that would be useful for, for this um, and out. And um, it's in an incredible amount of work to take within very inaccessible data and make it more accessible. I use the first year, but very much. I, so this is a weird question in some ways, but has your work to decode BMC data made it more digestible, made it OCA say, hey, we should be providing this in a better way from the start because it's already happened. Is there any sort of movement baffles, if you will, to the renovators of the data where they're saying, okay, well, now we see what it looks like. We understand its application. We're less afraid of it. But you know, in a better way, is that happening at all? Well, they don't tell us directly if they think about it that way, but <laughs> since <laughs> the area, <laughs> right? oh, see, I mean, oh, so, I mean, it can take me a second to pull up, but since they um, started giving us this data in the last couple of years, they began publishing the landlord tenant data year by year in still XML format. Yeah on their website. So the stuff that they started giving us, they just put it up on their website for anybody, not the address level, but the more generalized data, the stuff that you can get on GitHub, those CSVs. So if you want to take the XML and like do all the stuff that Maxwell did, you are now able to do that um, without, you know, working it out with them directly. And then they also have a dashboard of like landlord tenant cases and evictions and all this stuff. And I think that has been, that was maybe during COVID that they put that out. It's pretty a year or two after we started. Yeah. And so I, I, I have a feeling that it has something they wouldn't have yeah. done it exactly the way they did it. If we hadn't been like putting out these dashboards that I, I imagine that it had, you know, we, we've gotten some press coverage with the work and elected officials know about it and they're asking questions. And so I think it maybe has pushed the courts to put out their own version of it because they don't necessarily want to say, oh, sure. the housing data coalitions numbers are right or whatever it is they want to have control over, you know, what they say is like the, the quality and the accuracy of it. But also during COVID, it was such a big deal that I think that probably those two things combined is what made it happen. But we, yeah, we don't actually, we have a, we don't talk to them that much about it. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you find out, let me know. I mean, I'm just actually <laughs> So I was at your panel and then I had these questions like, what have you, what do you see as being the main differences between how this has played out for civil housing court, civil data on civil housing courts versus criminal courts from OCA? I mean, I, I think we're in such like a basic square one, you like very familiar and just even finding yet get out and moving on it. So it's uh, I think it's further along uh finding it that. Yeah, I just think it's so interesting that the same entity would be making some would be making something available in one realm and like very much not in the other. But maybe that speaks to the fact that they like don't want to really be doing it on any front. They just wait until they're yeah. 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 Did, did I, I, know the answer, I talked about this. I think there may be new arcs, and if you find it that they're you know I was in court level, then then the court level this data doesn't be better in you know, So it may be a factor that they. Would, I just have a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> on the DAP portal, um, I've spent a lot of time and I just think it's a fantastic tool. Fantastic tool. 
I've spent a lot of time downloading CSV files from all the court cases in Manhattan against all these individual, like up to 70 individual properties across the city. I now need to do the same for the Bronx, all the properties, specific properties in the Bronx. Has anything gotten easier or do I still need to go property by property and download all the court cases that were brought and was this uh, from the tenants to the land, against the landlord and how's of course housing court cases from the landlord against the tenant. Yeah, that portal just allows downloading up like the false peoples of data at individual properties. What did it Okay. Yeah, and that's still That's why I'm at the job clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's this less that eviction order than stabilization. Um, is it, I know you can request your own rent history and they nail it to you and it, it's a couple weeks and it's all tape copies. Um, is can I some array of uh, getting your own rent history or like figure data sense sex uh, rental history in a way it kind of proactively reach out to people who don't like know this hack to like individually request your rental history and basically basically like, to we proactively reach out to people who think might be getting overcharged and rent stabilized units and help them about it. Is there any data that helps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell, that's a great question. So actually, yeah, that, this is uh, one of the data sets that's in NYCBB that doesn't come from the open data portal or something like that. It comes from another kind of open source community uh, project of scraping uh, PDF documents that the, the city department of finance publishes every year for property tax bills that includes a charge for like a registration fee for each uh, rent stabilized apartment. And so from each one of the PDFs, you can get the count of the number of registered uh, rent stabilized properties. And so now we have like a data set for every building in the city for every year, how many registered rent stabilized units there are. Um, and that allows you to kind of track that over time, uh, also compare it uh, with other data sets against like the total number of units in the building. You can kind of see uh, like destabilization uh, in a building over time like that. So that's, you know, an example of a building we have it back in 2007 where there's been kind of a steady, slow loss of units um, over time in one of these buildings. So that's like kind of evidence of, of like a destabilization effort. And there's all different kind of like complex ways of like understanding that pattern of the loss of units relative to like timing of different legislative changes and the kind of rules of, of what ways you're allowed to uh, to like get units out of rent stabilization. And there's ways to kind of see patterns in that that would suggest like fraud or illegal destabilization of records. And so that would be one way to kind of in a data automated way, be able to identify some of that. Um, a kind of an example of this uh, that we've been doing um, at, uh, at my work at Justix is we were kind of using some of this data to partner with the Housing Rights Initiative uh, who brings the kind of like class action lawsuit cases against um, uh, landlords who are like engaging in fraud to legally destabilize units. So, so they're kind of using it in a similar way to kind of like try to proactively uh, find uh, like good cases for that. But um, there's not at a kind of individual level uh, way to get the rent histories uh, other than just requesting it. Uh, I mean, you could request it for somebody else, but like it's going to arrive to them. And um, I mean, probably. Um, Again, it's like kind of like door knocking and stuff like that. If you're like part of like a, an award that's kind of like interested in doing that kind of work, like you could easily, and this is something I've done in, in uh, time more on the kind of like tenant we're going to decide is using some of this data to kind of generate lists of kind of like priority buildings that you might want to reach out to that, you know, have a lot of complaints. So there's like active tenants there who are like, you know, um, not afraid of uh, retaliation and um, doing that work, but also have evidence of what likes uh, likely destabilization and all these other sorts of cases are kind of like good uh, opportunities to, to reach out individually. But for now, the only kind of official way to really know if it's stabilized is to request that rent history and it can only be mailed to the actual address um, of record. And so, yeah. But... Out of here, we're really interesting. And this is what I realize now that I actually used some of these results before in the coming. So it was great to see a big team more from the um, I mean, I'm thinking about um, the passage of uh, LLC Transparency Act, and so the Labwell System Workforce Corporation. Would that change at all? I guess the the, the recent years was that uh, we've been listening into landlords behind the LLC for courts and or enforcing it. So that, that with the common time, that, that could be in fact, I'll play through as I've been fixed. So, um, 
yeah, unfortunately, it, it sounded like that looked really promising that we might get uh, more of those names. And then they, they kind of, I, as I understood it, took out the, the provision that would actually make that database mm -hmm. public. Um, there is, uh, so on who owns what, what we do is actually not using those corporation records, but um, for multifamily property, rental properties, you are required to register the, the building with the kind of list of all of the uh, uh, parties related. So if it's an LLC that owns it, you have to list the head officer of that company um, in the, the, the registration records. And so that's the way to kind of, for us right now, given the data that's out there to, to get that information. And then we use those records with business addresses and things like that to kind of find a connection where we think that they're the, the same person on multiple buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, but for now, yeah, HPD registration records are, are the best way to get like actual names behind these LLCs. All right. But I'm going to add that the, 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 right. trans, the LLC Transparency Act in New York did strip out full yeah, public database. The Federal Corporate Transparency Act is being challenged right now, too, which may impact New York's as well. New York's wouldn't take effect for two years anyway. So there's a federal one that was supposed to take effect this year that's out with the private database for um, modern warfare. But it's, yeah, it's, it's being found. So it's not, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, thank you, everyone.